let's face it, the people around you that you want their voice, but not everybody either understands your context or cares about the company versus themselves. And as a leader, you got to filter those things out. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here. I've been a, a fan of his for many, many years. This is Jeff Immel. He's a venture partner now at NEA, New Enterprise Associates, but he was the former CEO of GE, and he is author of his fantastic new book, Hot Seat, What I'm going to hold it up right here for those of you watching Hot Seat, what I learned leading a great American company. And for those of you who are not as familiar with Jeff as I was prior to getting introduced to him, uh, Jeff, he's best known for his time as CEO of General Electric. Uh, he also followed a gentleman who I read every single thing he wrote, uh, Jack Welsh. So we're going to talk a little bit about following in, in those footsteps as well, which is uh, definitely something that I think can be challenging for any leader out there who's thinking about that or experiencing that. He's now a venture partner, as I mentioned, at New Enterprise Associates, and he's also the author of this amazing book, Hot Seat, which we're going to talk a lot about. And his memoir, like I said, is amazing. It recounts his experience in tough leadership as every story on this podcast does. It really goes through the nitty gritty, what you learned along the way, because I think just by hearing from people what they did learn and about those challenges, that just makes us better. So nearly four decades working for GE, amazing. And one interesting fact, he was promoted to the CEO of GE four days before 9-11. So what an incredibly crazy time to go through that experience as well as, as a new leader uh, running the company that he did. He is also a professor at Stanford. So we're going to get to talk to him about that too. So I'm going to be quiet now for just a couple of minutes and just welcome Jeff. Great, Kara. Thanks. Great to be with you. It's it's an honor as a consumer of Hint and uh, a fan of yours as well. So it's great to be with you. Oh, thank you. Well, very, very excited. So let's go back even before GE. So who was Jeff? Who was Jeff as a kid? Where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, kind of a classic middle class upbringing. My father was a middle manager at GE. So I knew GE really from birth. He worked there 38 years. So I kind of had, had a sense for, you know, he made engines and big products and things like that. And I was kind of a, let's say, the merger between like a math nerd and a football player. So those were the two things that kind of shaped my life. I was kind of studious and loved science and figuring things out and always uh, loved that. And I was a big team sport athlete. So a uh, football, baseball, basketball player did that throughout my entire uh, life. I I went to college at Dartmouth, and I was a math and physics major, and I was a football player, right? So, so I did those two things when I was in college. I graduated. I ran out of money, so I, I went to work for a couple of years, and I, I worked at Procter & Gamble, and my office mate was Steve Ballmer from Microsoft fame. So we were great pals when we were 22 years old. Decided to go back and get an MBA. Uh, which I did in 1980. You know, I, I kind of thought about being a you know big company, small company investor operator. I decided to kind of try to be an operator at a big company because I figured I'd learn how to be a manager and kind of what the world was all about. And started that path in 1982 at GE, and you know, kind of the rest is history. So I, I'd say, like, I've always loved problem solving. I was never intimidated by figuring stuff out. And I always like working with other people and working on teams and building teams. And in some way, shape or form, that's what I did for 40 years. 
I love that. Absolutely. Well, I always talk about, you know, team sports and I don't think people ever really described it this way to me as it growing up, but I, I always wanted to be on a team where there were people who were better than me. Right. And, and I think that, that you're always competing, but it's not any fun if you don't have people on you who are really, really great at something that maybe you think is impossible. So I was a gymnast. And so, you know, for me, I was my sports, uh, the, the things that I was decent at, I can't say I was Olympic level, but I was decent at vault and at bars and uneven bars. But for me, the balance beam was like, and the floor exercise, I never could dance, still can't dance. And so I, I, it was very, very difficult for me. So, but I always admired people and they were, they were kind of my goal out there, but I always see it in, in leaders today. It's team sports. Knowing what good looks like, you definitely get that in sports. You, You learn what good looks like. You learn how to play on a team. But the other thing is you learn, you learn failure. You know, like if you're, if you're playing, like I played offensive line in football, there's 80 plays, let's say in a game. Looking, if there's 80 plays in a the game, there's like 20 at least that you screwed up, but you mm-hmm. had to go back to the huddle. You had to get back with the team. You, you learn from your learn, experiences. You from it. And so I, I think those were, that's where some of the things that, uh, you, you know, it sounds trivial to say that sports is a, life-shaping experience, but it is a life-shaping experience for a lot of things that are quite practical in nature. Absolutely. So the first chapter of your excellent book, Hot Seat, opens a few days before the beginning of your role as CEO of GE. Why did you start there? I didn't want to write a business book. I, I hate most business books because they're preachy and I don't think they're very realistic. And so what I really wanted to do was tell a series of stories. In my case, you know, I, I can start with a great story, which is about 9-11. And again, one of the things I want readers to kind of understand is that we live at a moment in, in, in the history of the world where there's just all these non-synchronous events that are taking place all the time. So crisis leadership is really leadership today. And so I think in chapter one of the book, you trip right into the crisis of 9-11 uh, you see it through the eyes of somebody that's been in the job for four days and four days only and had all these dreams about what I wanted to do with the company and had been through one of the most public succession processes in the history of the world. And and the day I start, uh, this incredible crisis takes place. And it really, in some ways, reshaped the generation of people from, a, I mean, we're, we're living with this Afghanistan uh, crisis right now. And You know, you talk about 20 years we've been there. And if you think about everything that's happened in business the last 20 years, it's it's really staggering. So so I figured that was a good way to start the book, to take the reader right into here's what crisis leadership feels like. Here's the decisions I had to make and and hopefully captivating the reader to say, look, this is going to be a raw story. It's going to talk about the ups and the downs. And and, uh, in my case, I started with a a crisis, not just for the company I led, but also for uh, the entire world, certainly the U.S. Absolutely. And obviously, you were talking about you're the CEO of GE, which, uh, you know, definitely lots of things are made by it's not just about electric. There's uh, a healthcare division. There's uh, a lot. We had insurance. So on 9-11, we owned aircraft. Mm -hmm. We had aircraft engines. We insured the World Trade Center and we covered it on NBC. So basically, we had a third of the company that was immediately impacted by uh, this terrible crisis. And so let, let's say two weeks after, let's say a week after I started, we're having these nightly kind of crisis calls on how we're going to deal with the airlines who are all going bankrupt because commercial aviation just shut down. So I would walk into a meeting with 20 people and we'd say, look, if we don't buy a billion dollars at this airline's bonds by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, they're going to go bankrupt. And I listened to the presentation and I say, okay, guys, what do you want to do? You got me. I don't really, I, I don't really know kind of like all the dynamics. And we'd sit around and talk about it. And I was lucky, Kara, at that time. I had a vice chairman who was 
really experienced, very crusty and, and a real curmudgeon, but a great guy named Dennis Nariman. And, you know, I'd have everybody leave the room and I'd say, okay, Dennis, what do you think we should do? And he would say, let's do this. And I'd say, okay, we'll do it your way, right? We'll, we'll think about it. But, you know, just billion dollar decisions every day on like, how do we keep airlines alive? What do we do? And, you know, you just have to, you, you know, what you find is in a crisis, leaders show up. And sometimes the best role of leadership is to absorb fear, right? You you have to be a shock absorber and not an accelerator. And I think if you've lived through COVID and all the things you've had to do, every all the things entrepreneurs have to do is frequently absorb the, the volatility so that you can just show your team a path forward. You know, just thinking on that on that time and, and frankly for, for me it was even, you know, March twenty twenty when I was I was definitely uh, feeling a lot of of what you described in the book too. That how did you know how to lead? I mean, how did you know you had never yeah, quite been through that time? It, it's it's a it's a great question because to a, to a certain extent, you know, certainly look by the time March twenty twenty turned around, this was like my fifth, my fifth tail risk event. So I was quite you know I could give advice, but you know you you have to go to root instincts, which, which are. Um, you know, again, people are either good at absorbing fear or they're not. People have instincts for showing up. I think communication has to get sharper. You, you know, really, you know, you have to lean into people you trust. And, and in my case, the people you trust the most are people that always put the company first ahead of their own desires. And maybe the most difficult thing, if you think about March 2020 and somebody in your shoes, is you have to hold two truths at the same time to be a leader. You have to have the truth that things can always get worse. And, and in some cases, it can get worse in a terrible way. But the other truth is you want hint to exist in the future. You've, you've spent your life building it. You, you, you don't want to give up on your dreams to build a platform or, you know, in your case, uh, uh, you know, deodorant or suntan lotion or things like that. So, you know, the best, the advice I gave people in March 2020, particularly the ones that were the first time entrepreneurs, was learning how to hold two truths at the same time. You've got to play defense, but you've got to play offense. And you've got, to, you've got to be able to communicate the paradox between the two. Absolutely believe that. I mean, reading from the book, the, from your book, The Hot Seat, I loved this. Uh, I'll quote it. The most crucial component of leadership is the willingness to make decisions. And I think that recognizing those two pieces that things could get worse, but you have to move. You could move slower, but you yep. can't freeze. I mean, I talk to leaders, to, right? You can't freeze. I talk to you leaders. You can't to worry about the critics. You know, in other words, I think, I think we live in a hater's world, you know, and you're going to get criticized no matter what you do. And I think good leaders, they know how to listen, but they also know how to make, you know, when to make the decisions, who to listen to and, and, uh, and who not to listen to. Right. So I think that's uh, that's the other part that you see, I think, all the time, but particularly during a crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the more crises you go through, I mean, certainly you you were through some challenges before that. But the more you go through, you're actually getting stronger. I was telling an entrepreneur the other day, I said, they, she was pretty bummed out by some conversations that she had had with uh, a doubter, I call them, you know, the, the critics. And I said, can you imagine how they would feel if they knew that they're at, but the stuff that they're saying to you is actually making you stronger and a better leader? And she said, what are you talking about? It's a, and I said, no, it's, it's, it's actually, it's building your, your resilience and your tenacity. And it, I just made you laugh through this whole thing, yeah. but more than anything, you, you will get through this and you will get through it's this. So time, true. Right. It's so true. And you have to show up, you know, in other words, I think, you know, I've been watching like, like every American, you watch what's going on and. Who's kind of showing up and leading and, and, and who isn't? And, you know, I, I think picking your critics and, and, you know, whose criticism, because 
I always used to like care. I, I like to make decisions in a crowded room. You know, I, I didn't like going with two or three people because I believed in the transparency was motivational, particularly to good people. But if you if you make a decision in front of 20 people, there's going to be three or four that disagree with you. But, you know, I, I think I differentiated between critics who were critical because they really wanted to find the right answer. And their voice mattered to me. And I differentiated on the other side, people that were critical because they were just lazy. They were lazy intellectually. They were lazy personally. They just didn't want to. Right. And over the, the course of my career, you know, and it, it, this is, sounds crazy today, right? But in 2005, we started a clean tech initiative. We believed in climate change and we want to do something about it. The entire company criticized me, right? Yeah. The entire company. Oh, now said, it's well, early. 2005 for that conversation. Well, that's you know, real early. Soft, you know, it's, it's, it makes you look soft. You know, that's, mm -hmm. but, but I, I recognized that I wasn't going to listen to them because most of them didn't understand the science had kind of an old perspective on, you know, look, companies pollute, NGOs are stupid, blah, blah, blah. And that life was changing. That world was changing. So I diff always differentiated in my own mind, who would I listen to? And who would I just let them talk, but just say, okay, I hear you, but we're That's not what way. we're doing. Yeah. Well, my way this time. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting. Many, many years ago, and it was one of my first roles was at a company called CNN. And I was really fortunate to be able to work uh, inside of CNN when it was kind of a late stage startup. We didn't even call it that, but it was maybe in 60% of households in, in the U.S. And the only reason why I uh, knew about CNN as a 22 year old was I lived on the Upper West Side and I couldn't have television unless I had cable. And so I, I, I had to get it because there were too many buildings around me. And anyway, I remember Ted Turner would come into the office and, and we all thought he was a little crazy. I mean, depending on the day, we thought he was really inspiring, but you know, there were moments that, you know, he just kept saying the same thing over and over again, that the world needs 24 hour news. And, you know, we're like, do they? I mean, there's a lot of people that say they don't really, he doesn't really need 24 hour news. But I think that that's the other thing that I see in a leader is that they're consistent, right? Yeah. He believed it and he put those stakes in the ground and he kept saying it. And then ultimately when the Gulf War rolled around and, you know, the leader of Iraq reached out to the president and said, my, I see that my country is being bombed. All of a sudden we all said Ted was right, but nobody was saying he was right until there was like an incident where they could catch up to him and they yeah, could really yeah. see it. And, and I think that stories like that, you know, even, even that that's part of my own journey. Right. Where I see the people that are a little crazy, the Steve Jobs of the world, the, you know, you right where you've got a belief system. And at some point, you know, I've just learned to kind of listen to those people. Right. This that they, the they, thing, Kara, it, it's the hardest thing that I have to work on with my students because they, you know, for good reasons, they get taught for two years that listening to everybody is what you should do if you're a good leader. And by and large, that's true. Right. Finally, you should respect everybody for sure. But I said, look, you know, guys, I got to tell you, I, I know I got to know Stephen Jobs a little bit. He didn't listen to everybody. I know Elon Musk a little bit. He doesn't listen to everybody. I know Warren Buffett a little bit. He doesn't listen to everybody. Right. So you, you've got to know what you believe in. You've got to be consistent with your beliefs. You can still learn. And let's face it, the people around you that you want their voice, but not everybody either understands your context or cares about the company versus themselves. And as a leader, you got to filter those things out. There's a lot of people, you know, G had 330,000 people when I retired. I love them, right? And they were amazing people and I, and I owe so much to them. But there were a few that didn't put the company first. And, and it's your job to kind of screen those, those people out. Yeah, definitely. So we talked about Jack Walsh a little bit. So jumping into that role, I mean, what, I mean, those are big shoes to fill. I mean, yes. how, right. I, it's like, how do you do that? I mean, on the one hand, I mean, you, you talked about 
Afghanistan. I mean, I, I was just thinking about this as I was reading your book, too. I mean, I'm sure there's a few people that are looking at Biden and saying, well, if Obama was in, I mean, this is what he'd do, right? Like, did you did you ever feel like that where there were? Oh, sure. You know, it's hard. Play, you know, Welch in 2000 was voted the best manager of the previous century by Fortune magazine. I mean, that's that's 100 years. That's a long time, you know. So like, the first thing I would say is I, I loved working for him. I learned so much from him. He was a, he was really a good leader and a good person to learn from. But I didn't want to be him. And, and the main difference was the times were just so different. I knew they were. I, 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 I had real strong instincts, particularly, you know, in the late 90s that we we're missing out on some things that were going to be important in the future. And so, you know, the trick is how do you bring an entire company with you as you try to go to the places you think you need to get to while never like pointing fingers, you know, because you, you always want people to be proud of what they've done. And and certainly you never want to, you know, somebody that famous, but to say, look, we're, we're almost 80% inside the United States, a company our size, we've got to, We've got to be more global. We, we've lost our technology edge as a company. We've got to be more technical. We have almost no women in senior leadership positions. We've got to be more diverse, right? Our customers don't really like us. We've got to be closer, you know? And so I had these big ideas where I felt like, you know, Jack had either missed the boat or, or just wasn't contemporary. And and you wanted to bring people with you while never say you know doing anything that would ever denigrate his greatness because you know he was he was a great fun person to work with. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Did he was he still around? At, yeah, at- no, he was always around. Look, I, I think um, he always wanted a public life, you know, Kara. So he was on CNBC and stuff like that a lot. He was mm-hmm. available when I wanted to use him. And, you know, there were moments in time, if you read the book, where we weren't the best of friends, but every Mm -hmm. time for the 15 years I ran the company, I had a really tough decision to make. I would call him and and he would offer good advice. And, and so we always had, um, uh, you know, we always had that kind of relationship uh, throughout, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard replacing a famous person. You know, if you if you have a choice in your career for your viewers, uh, replace a bum. It's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> right. Then you can. It's only up from here. So, exactly. yeah, exactly. absolutely. Well, I think, you know, obviously the in reading the book, the biggest challenge challenges were actually inherited. I mean, you don't know it necessarily until lots of other things come into into play. But I think that that as as you started to dig in deeper i mean things like innovation and and we're not as critical i mean what would you say i think so often large companies i've certainly met many many leaders uh, along the way who have really kind of felt like they were answering to wall street around profitability versus investing in innovation um you know clearly even Coca-Cola, um, we're seeing them just cut, 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 cut to get closer and closer to profitability versus um, looking at innovating in any way. I mean, in my industry, I just, how do you think about that today? Like, can, can, you, can you grow and be a kind of a growth company, an innovative company, and also focus on profitability? I mean, what, what, is it? I mean, this is a deep. This is really a deep and important question. It's, it's almost another another entire podcast. But you know, I grew up in an era of professional management, really, and so you know what I was trained to do really was more what private equity people do today. You, you know, you were you were you know invest a little bit of growth, take cost out, you know, hit these metrics, things like that. That wasn't the kind of leader I wanted to be, but that was what I was trained to be. You know, I, I had a pretty good instinct that we were heading into a technical era and that and that the the company, our company, needed to be much more technical, much more global. And look, if you've looked at what's happened um, you know, in the in the 
let's say the subsequent 15 or 20 years, you know, I would say GE was a conglomerate that was founded on professional management. Um, Apple is, or let's say Amazon's a conglomerate founded on technology. You know, the conglomerates of this era are all, are all really deep technical uh, conglomerates. So that's point number one. If, if you're not investing in technology, you're not going to be leading anything for long. I think point number two is, look, if I wanted to start an all-electric aircraft company today, I could raise a billion dollars, right? Now, Boeing, you know, Boeing's, they're going to worry about that. And they're saying, we can't afford that. We can't go that direction. Uh, you know, you've, you've grown your company. You know, if you look at throughout the consumer product space, look, you can raise venture money to do anything P&G or Coke or Pepsi do today. That's different. So I would say if you're a big company and you're not innovating and you're not growing, and you're not recruiting the right people, you're not attracting the right people, you know, you're going to get left behind. And it may not happen in a quarter or two, but it's going to happen in a, you know, half a generation or something like that. So I see a lot, you know, because I'm a, I'm a legacy person living in startup world. So there's probably not a month that goes by that I don't see, you know, CEOs of my, my old friends who I have breakfast with at the Rosewood or something like that who are saying, you know, how do I get more fintech or how do I get batteries or how do I get that or how do I get this? And that to me is kind of the secret of the next five or 10 years. If you're a legacy company, you've got to do enough innovation to protect your position. And if you're a startup, you know, I'd say legacy companies have never been more vulnerable than they are right now. You know, I talked to many leaders who still, I mean, look at the pandemic and they're cutting costs. They're doing everything that you're talking about around, you know, maintain profitability. And yet they know all these things and they, and they want to act that way, but they don't do it. Right. You've and got to have permission. You've got, you've got to find a way to have permission to change, right? You just do. The, the thing that I, it impressed me about your book was how quickly like AOL became a bureaucracy, you know, so that's the other, that's the other kind of like watchword is, you know, if you're, a, you know, people, people in the Valley already look at like Google as an old company. I look at them as an amazing kind of what they totally. say, oh, it's too slow, it's too bureaucratic. And so when I, I got a little uh, chuckle when I, when I was reading, you know, Donna to say like, you know, AOL is maybe eight years old. And through your eyes, they were already moving slowly and couldn't make decisions and not, you know, you had to rock the boat to get stuff done. And, you know, it's just good. It's yeah, there's just, good. just well, and, and there were a lot of pieces of, of that as well that I think is really interesting. I was I was actually on a podcast yesterday talking about this, that when I came into when I came into AOL through an acquisition that had started inside of Apple, that a little known Steve Jobs uh, concept uh, that was called En Passant inside of uh, inside of Apple that was later called Two Market. We were acquired by America Online, but I mean, Steve Case may not want to admit this or or uh, or maybe he didn't believe this, but he was number three to Prodigy and CompuServe. I mean, those yeah. were, you know, the online services that were that he was not, you know, there yet. And I think for me, supporting an underdog and supporting somebody that had a strategy and a mission that was that I believed in. Again, I had done this with. It, you know, CNN, and it, it just, it felt very familiar, but I'm a, I'm a builder, right? Yeah. And, and I think that that's what I've, I've shared with many business schools and, and uh, students and entrepreneurs along the way, understanding what you love doing and understanding, yeah. you know, the different types of uh, people that are needed. I think I got to a point when it was a billion dollars in revenue where, they needed a manager. They needed somebody yeah. who really enjoyed mentoring and managing. And I really wanted to just go blow things up some more and go build well, some more. The companies, you know, Kara, like, like I, I always say, you know, we had, we had operators, we had analysts, we had builders inside GE. Um, extremely rarely we had people that were all three. You know, I could probably name 20 in my 
35 years there who I would consider to actually play. But that was okay, right? You know, there was a place. And, and what you really had to do as CEO of a company like G is you had to protect the builders because everybody wanted to, you know, screw them up. You know, I, I had a guy named Omar Ishrak, and he ran the ultrasound business for me and then went on to run Medtronix. And he was a builder. He was a deep scientist. And 75% of my interface with Omar was protecting him from the bureaucrats that wanted to blow him up every day. And he, he, built, a, he, you know, he built an ultrasound business from $100 million to $4 billion a year. So if you, can, if you can give a builder the advantages of a big company without bringing along the disadvantages of a big company, you can, you can make things happen. And that's something I think Bezos has done pretty successfully at, at Amazon has protected kind of this building culture while still playing the big company game when they need to. And that's a trick. That's hard to do. Finding those people that are angels in, in many yeah. ways and that are able to do that. I, I interviewed a, a gentleman, Avram Miller. Have you ever met Avram? I know the name. Yeah. Yeah. And so he just, his book is just coming out uh, in, in a few weeks. I just interviewed him on my podcast, but Avram was really kind of considered the grandfather of broadband. And yeah. he had that in Andy Grove at Intel yeah. and where he basically was able to kind of do whatever he wanted to do. And, and uh, he's another one I've just admired for years, but you need those people when, when you have those kind of people inside of your company, they don't look the same. They're known as misfits. They don't, I mean, you know, that, that very much is, uh, I, I can relate in some ways to, to that as well. And, and, uh, and that was, you know, for me, the, t the times at, at AOL and sort of what they were going through. And then all my previous companies were folded into one and my husband yeah. worked for uh, Netscape. And so he ended up coming in and we were all part of the transition team. It was a, it was a definitely a crazy time for, for yeah, sure. It's a good, it's a good, you know, look when it works, you know, big companies can do amazing things when they really, when it works. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you raised the most important point, which was the technology is moving so quickly. And, you know, there's just this universal wallet today, right? You, you don't, you know, you can raise money to fund ideas. I think that's what's really different today than it was even 20 years ago, which is all good, all disruptive ideas get funded. And the ones, you know, if you say, okay, I worry about this, but it'll never get to my industry because nobody will do it. There's going to be somebody that does it, right? That's, that's really a terrible, that's a terrible approach on most boardrooms. So yeah, that, no, at, at Absolutely. And so you talk about boardrooms. How do you pick a board? What do you what do you think are the, the key components for picking that board? Yeah, look, I think there's I think there's maybe two or three ways to think about it. I think one is swimming, right? In other words, you want people that can bring relevant expertise uh, to the company you're trying to build, right? So in our case, Somebody that knew healthcare was very valuable, or somebody that knew globalization was very valuable, or towards the end of my career, like somebody that was um, uh, uh, new digital transitions and things like that. Those are so that's kind of swim lane. You want people that have just good judgment that they they know when to speak, they know how to be collegial because. They really are. There is really no hierarchy in a boardroom. You know, I was chairman, but I could get fired at any meeting, really. So I never acted like a chairman. And, and so you've, you've got uh, you've got that. But the most important element of a board member is, are they willing to put the company ahead of their own reputation? Everybody says they will, but you don't know that until the worst day. You don't know that. And so I tell all my the CEOs I work with, look around the room, picture the worst day you can possibly imagine in your life, and who's going to stab you in the back, who's going to help you through that. And that, to me, is the best attribute of a board. Um, two weeks after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, uh, uh, Washington Mutual went bankrupt and destroyed the bondholders, and we were getting crushed, right? So we decided on a Friday night that we were going to go raise as much equity as we possibly could, which turned out to be $18 billion in 48 hours, right? 
So I had to do a board call on a Saturday morning. And, you know, this was September 30th of 2008. And I'm, you know, it's maybe 15 people on the call and maybe 15 in my conference room. And I'm like, hey, guys, you know, you can probably see that, you know, we're getting crushed and lots going on in the world. And we're going to raise $18 billion on my bank. <laughs> and you could hear just silence on the phone. And then Roger Penske, who was an entrepreneur, a race car, you know, race car magnet, entrepreneur, great guy. He just, so dead silence. He says, you guys are right. Let's get the money. And then everybody else, 20 voices. Let's get the money. Let's get the money. Let's get the money. But without Roger, I might still be in that conference room, you know, 15 years later. Um, that's the kind of people you want on the board that, that always really put the company first ahead of their own reputation. And you never know that until you're at the worst day of your life. And that's what people like you have to do, right? Because there's going to be, you're going to have lots of great days ahead. But you're going to have a few shitty ones and, and you just want to you need a few people that are with you on that day. And I think even if you disagree with them, knowing where they stand, I think totally. that, that is that is the other thing that is is so critical. I mean, I, I've said to entrepreneurs, I've seen many things along the way, and it's like I, I appreciate when you actually know where people stand and whether yeah. it's in a boardroom or outside, because so often you know, when they're just saying what they think will make you happy, then that's not good either, right? It's just... Well, in 2010 or 11, it was clear that we weren't going to be able to stay in GE Capital unless we bought a bank. Mm -hmm. So I had a board meeting. And what I used to do in my board meetings when it was a really tough decision, we had a bank that we were going to buy, is I would go to each board member and ask them to speak individually, to hear mm -hmm. their own voice. We run around the table the vote was like 14 and one in favor. And, and the woman who was against it was Shelly, La Shelly Lazarus, who I love. Mm -hmm. And she was so articulate. I said, you know what? We're not going to do the deal. We're not going to do the deal because Shelly's so articulate. She's so right. You know, I, are you, we, are you guys okay if we don't do it this way? Right. And my G capital guys were angry as can be. But to your point, you know, you need these true voices. Yeah. And Billy was coming at it, you know, not from like, I don't want to be in a bank or stuff like that. It was just pure, like, I don't think it's right for the company. I don't think it's right for the team. I don't think we can manage it appropriately. You know, 100% pure. So, you know, they're hard to find. They're hard to find. You don't know until the chips are down or you've got a big deal you're working on or things like that. And that's and boards are important. Right. And the, the other thing I would say is what I always try to do is complete transparency. So I would make the board go visit our businesses without me there. Uh, they had full access if they wanted to see a team or meet a manager or I, my team could speak with them without going through me. I think you owe your board kind of complete transparency, but what they owe you is if they've had access to transparency and full information, they can't say, well, I never heard that or, you know, I, I wasn't aware or things like that. So that's kind of a good two way street. Accountability, transparency. I absolutely love this. So what's it like? Uh, so you've moved from being inside of a company to being inside of, uh, you know, the money side, as I as I call it. So what how was that transition for you? You know, I thought I wanted to. So I, I had a couple ideas when I retired. I wanted to work with small private businesses. I wanted to work on disruption. And, you know, you know, care my my career didn't end exactly the way I wanted it to. And I needed time to think. I, I, need, I needed just to get out of the line of fire. I needed time to think. And, you know, my wife and I had lived all over the world and every place, but we had never lived in California. And I, and I convinced my wife, I just said, look, I, I, you know, we need time away from this. I need to get into a different vibe. I need, I need time to think. And so, and I know that in the A team from uh, years gone by, and I wanted to, I wanted to do primarily healthcare. I wasn't sure what else I wanted to do. And so I, I wanted to get away. California was a good place to be. Uh, I wanted to work on healthcare startups. I wanted to work in venture. 
I wanted to really build a new a new network in Silicon Valley. And looking back uh, over four years, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. It's it's just been, um, you know, look. I mean, I think if you read the book, like like I said, things things didn't work the way I wanted them to do. In many ways, my heart got broken numerous times. But you can keep going, right? I, I, I wanted to keep going. I didn't want to give up. I wanted to keep learning. And I've loved I've loved NEA. And I would say, you know, like small companies want to get big. I can help them in that, right? I'm not going to write code or or I probably can't help you build a brand. That's something you know how to do. But I can help you think about how do you go from 150 million to 500 million or a billion or if you if you want to take hint to China, I don't know what the direct translation is. They could use you in China. I can tell, I don't know what your water source is going to be, but it would be it would be awesome. I can help you do that, right? And then big companies want to get small, so I I I, I can also help big companies try to think through what's digital transformation going to be like and things like that. So uh, I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed teaching. I think teaching has been great. So yeah. That's, that's and what kinda, exactly, to just share a little bit what your role is at Stanford then? Yeah, so we teach a course called Systems Leadership. I have a co-teacher who's a guy named Rob Siegel. And it's basically a course on disruption. Um, we have 10 classes and we bring in five startup CEOs and five legacy CEOs. And we try to talk about, you know, how the legacy companies are trying to, you know, you know, like we will have an automotive CEO and he or she will talk about how they're trying to do autonomous vehicles or electric vehicles. And then we'll have, you know, a startup battery company talk about how he's he or she's trying to sell to uh, the automotive industry. And so it's basically a course on disruption. We teach it through it. the eyes of the founder and the CEO. And I think my, my hope is that it makes our students a little bit smarter a little bit less judgmental and gives them a little bit more confidence that they can figure it out on their own and are going to have to. Yeah. Such a, such a great program. And you're such an amazing leader with, you know, clearly known. And I, I love absolutely meeting you because you, you are all about head and heart, but you've also seen a lot and, and uh, you own your mistakes uh, along the way too, or own your challenges and what you learn from those along the way. And I think it's just, you're, you're known as a real person and an authentic person. So for, for me as a leader, you know, I've learned a lot just by reading I mean, look, for me, GE has been all that you've done around automation. I mean, it's something that I, I had turned in my manuscript before uh, March of 2020. And, and it, was, it, it was really the stuff that we had done four years prior that got us right. ready for the pandemic. We did a lot around automating our supply chain when others in the beverage industry weren't doing that. And that ultimately we did it because we're doing a preservative free product when the beverage industry in general uses a lot of preservatives and I didn't want to use preservatives. And so we wanted to get people out of the room. It's like, you know, beginning science, like bacteria, somebody sneezes, they don't even have to be sick, but during a pandemic that really saved us. So I think for, for me, it was, you need people who are, you know, tactical leaders, I think, as as you've shown, you have the ability to to kind of roll up your sleeves and get it done. But then also people that have head and heart and and gut and rely on, you know, other people, uh, trusted people. I, I just feel like you you have so much there. So these students are lucky for sure. I wish I was able to go. And that's what I said. I think I'm I going back to teacher. Me. I need you as a teacher sometimes. So don't, I, I would. Help. I would love it. I've, I've actually, uh, I keep saying actually one of those schools in, in England actually said when, when you decide to, to leave Hint and, and, uh, I don't know when that will be, but they said you can come and come back to school. And I'm like, don't tempt me because I think I might, I might come and actually Stanford well, offers. The, the other thing I saw in your book, Kara, that I hope comes to in hot seat that I think people can learn from is, You've got to own your own narrative, really. And, and it's, not, it's not for yourself. Like, in other words, you and I, we're going to do okay. We're going to find, you know, 
different things to do in our life. But all the people we've touched and worked with and worked, you know, worked so hard for us, you're speaking for them as well. And if people lie about them, if people aren't true to them, if people aren't treating them the right way, you know, good leaders have to go in the alley sometimes and, and, and fight for their teams. And I think that gets, that gets lost, I think, in, in this, you know, in this world of social media and political correctness, people lose sight of the fact that sometimes, look, you, you've got to fight for yourself and, and, and you've got to be willing to do that. And, and I think I read that in your book and I hope people that read uh, Hot Seat see the same thing. Such an incredible book. I want to encourage everyone. Um, I'm actually going to go back and read it for the second time. I have a flight tomorrow <laughs> and there's uh, parts of it that I want to read. You actually sent me an email about Shoe Dog. I think I read Shoe Dog 12 times. I mean, I, yeah, I kept going exactly. back and, uh, and I'd love to interview Phil Knight at some, at some point. I, 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 I thought your book has a lot of that. And I, I'd say the best story that I saw in your book was what you did when you lost Starbucks account. Yeah. I think every entrepreneur should read that. I forget the name of the chapter, but you know, those are the things that are just must reading for entrepreneur, anybody really, but how you act, uh, when those things happen, I think is, is critical. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, uh, it's definitely, and even, you know, over, over time you start, I mean, our, our direct to consumer business has tripled during the pandemic. And, yeah. you know, I talk about, I, I connect the dots back to Starbucks and, yeah. and again, when you're in it, when you're in those challenging and hairy times, you, you, wish they would stop and go away. But I think that if that wouldn't have happened, Amazon for us and our beginnings of e-commerce wouldn't have happened. And and then our own direct-to-consumer business, which is half of our business of our company now is direct-to-consumer. And and so oh. I'm grateful, you know, that that, that yeah. Starbucks, you know, that's where it all started. The other lesson is I can't tell you how many times I've heard an entrepreneur say, my customer's an idiot, you know, or else they'd buy more. And I always say, mm, I wouldn't use that approach if I were you. <laughs> you know, they're telling you something. Every time you lose a deal or every time it goes slowly, they're telling you something about, your, about yourself. And I, and I feel like that is a huge gap among the venture capital community. And, and you deal with it so adroitly, I think, uh, in the book. But it, again, it's, I, I take it back to my class in Stanford. Young people today, everybody today, they want stories. They, they, they want to see what it feels like. They don't want to be lectured to. They don't want checklists. You know, they don't like any of that stuff. They want it, they want it raw and they want it real. And I think that's, you know, no matter what you're doing, that's what you got to tell. That's, that's how you get your message across. Well, and I felt that way just about your book as well, that I didn't feel I, it's a style issue that some books have, but at the end, when they say, here's what you should have learned about this, it makes me mental, right? Because I think, do they just think I'm stupid as I'm reading this book? I mean, why don't you allow me to take what I want from this chapter? What are the lessons? Yeah. And I think that that for me has been, you know, really rewarding to hear people you know, remember the Starbucks story, remember the financial crisis and dealing mm -hmm. with my investors and, you know, and all of those things, it's, you know, they weren't pretty when we were going through it, but we got through it mm -hmm. and we figured a lot of stuff out along the way. And I think it's so many lessons. So hot seat, buy, buy, buy this book or listen on audible. And, uh, definitely Jeff, you are just this amazing leader that I feel so fortunate to be able to have you here. And I cannot wait to watch more of what you do. And uh, very, very excited. So everyone, thank Thanks, you Carol. for listening. We're here every Monday and Wednesday with amazing, amazing leaders who share a lot of their stories. And I would love it if you would all buy a copy of Hot Seat. And definitely, Jeff, thank you again for coming Thanks on. Again. Really, really a pleasure. And I hope to meet you in person someday. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone.